I will try to start off a bit uh, interactive. Yeah. So uh, just for me to know what who's in the audience. So who of you has uh, done something with machine learning, not necessarily deep learning, <coughs> but neural networks? Okay, that's cool. Um, so yeah, I'm. I can assume that you will you know the basic concepts. And please, if if I bore you, just make a sign. I will go on if I explain too much in detail. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I tried to choose a catchy title from training to coaching in neural networks, and uh, hopefully by the end you will uh, get an idea of what I mean by that, and um, hopefully you are not uh, too disappointed that it's not a completely new way of doing machine learning with the team. Um, so that's a big overview of what I'm trying to tell you today, hopefully I will uh, make it in time. Um, so I will give a very brief introduction where I come from and who I am and why I tell you all this and um, why not everything might be applicable to you. Um, then I will uh, go to three different topics which of course interact, but uh, I want to treat them separately, separately like uh, how do you deal with the data, how do you deal with uh, little resources you might have because you want to make your um, network mobile, or uh, you don't want to spend thousands of watts on uh, training your nets, or uh, you can't afford to use GPU or whatever. And uh, then as a last topic, I will uh, like to talk about debugging neural networks, which means what to do if you want to solve a problem with the neural net, um, but it just doesn't work because your training doesn't converge. What could you actually do to um, hopefully get it running, um, which is, in my opinion, um, problem that occurs most often if you start with, with new data sets. Um, so maybe first, I'm not a, the biggest fan of neural networks, however, um, um, in our group I was desperate enough to be the first one actually trying it to solve a problem and it worked eventually after like half a year. Um, so um, yeah, sometimes it's better than everything else, um, sometimes it's just annoying. Uh, I guess many of you will know that uh, if you've ever trained one net, which was not just a tutorial net you produced uh, from the internet. Okay, so the first part, who am I, where am I coming from, and what does coaching actually mean? Um, so, um, I'm, I started as an electrical engineer in 2008, and uh, I've worked as a software developer for Airbus and DNA Systems, and as a system engineer, and then uh, I thought it might be time to go back to university, so I did another master's degree on top, and uh, then eventually started doing a PhD in 2015, which hopefully I will finish next year. Um, in that time, I've supervised around 20, 25 ish uh, theses. Um, most of them were trying to implement neural nets to solve some problems, and that's pretty much where my experience comes from. Um, that's just because most of the students see the newspaper articles, they get some nice NVIDIA newsletters, and they say, yeah, I'd like to do that. Uh, I even bought me a GTX 1080, now I want to use it. <laughs> and um, yeah, so as you will see, we've discovered quite some problems with that. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, I can give some ideas of how uh, you could benefit from the weeks and months we spend on trying to get things run. Um, so that's our group. Um, head of uh, our research group is uh, Professor Shelley Young. Um, we are mainly working on pattern recognition and image analysis, and we have strong links to the University Hospital in Münster and uh, to the biology department in Münster. Um, so most of the data we have looks uh, just like this. Uh, so that's a 3D microscopy image of, uh, of cells. I can try to go back and forth and maybe we get the animation back. So that's a 3D stack of cells. Um, that's uh, Drosophila melanogaster larvae, that's fruit flies, actually crawling around, and biologists want to know how they behave if you change the genome and stuff like this. And uh, down here, if the video loads eventually, um, you can, um, that's, that's a project we have with the neurosurgeon at the University Hospitals, and they try to visualize the blood perfusion in the brain when during open brain surgery, which is quite a cool project. Um, okay, it doesn't seem to load, maybe I can show afterwards to whoever is um, interested. So the biggest problem we have with that data is that um, usually we don't have any labels at all, or if we have labels, then we only have a few. 
right, a very nice example is, is this data set where I think there are about 800 cells or clusters of cells in that image and labeling 120 of them um, was two weeks work of one biologist who just sat there and did fossilized labeling of that cell. And so you can imagine it's, it's not as easy to say, okay, I need 10 more data sets of this because it's just uh, impossible to, to do that in a research environment. And even if you were a company and you could pay people for do that, you would have to make sure that they are properly trained, that they know what they're doing. So you just can't put it on mechanical turf because it won't work. Um, so those are the problems we usually have, where we have only very little data. However, we might have customers um, who say, no, no, we want to do something with neural networks, just because if we write that in a grant proposal, we get the money. If you write in there, we, uh, we want to use a support vector machine, and everyone said, yeah, we've done that before, so we know we don't get any. Um, so yeah, usually it's like proof of concept work, uh, a master's student does, or uh, two bachelor's students do, and uh, yeah, they only have those little data sets and lots of problems usually getting it running in the first place. Um, other stuff we are doing um, is object tracking and even some more theoretical mathematical things like high dimensional embeddings, which comes handy at some point. Um, yeah, so we are a pretty broad crew. Um, okay, so training versus coaching. What do I mean when I say coaching? So, um, as we've heard multiple times in this room, and I guess in other rooms as well, um, there's quite some discrepancy in between what you read in um, in the newspaper and in your newsletters you get from the big players um, and what you actually experience yourself when, when doing that stuff, so if you believe um, or if you read what the big, big players are doing, they have heaps of data available, it might be labeled, might be unlabeled, but at least much more than our university has, has and I get uh, much more than the average small company has uh, at hand. And, uh, in my opinion, basically what they're doing is using a sledgehammer to crack nuts. So, um, if you read articles on machine learning from like 20 or 30 years ago, you get the idea that what they did is they took all their data, they smashed it on a machine, they let it run for two weeks, and whatever came out, they reported as a result. <coughs> and in some way, I still think that's what's going on today, just that you have lots more data and lots more GPUs in that machine, so you get better results. Uh, just because you do more number crunching. Of course, that's not completely true. So, um, especially with with the big players that do the training, we know, um, they also come up with new ideas, how to train networks on multiple devices in parallel, or how to handle the big data, or uh, they come up with new ideas for activation functions, or new layers, or you name it. Um, and we can profit from that, so I don't want to tell they're not doing right research. Uh, I just wanted to tell that they do other research as we do it in our usual business. Um, okay, so what do we have? We have the limited data sets I spoke about. Um, we need expert labeling, which is very expensive, either time-wise or money-wise or both. Um, we have very restricted compute resources, because even if we have like a cluster at the university, which we can use, which has uh, up to, I think, 60 nodes with GPUs in it, um, however, we share that among multiple departments. So uh, if you want to start a training job, you might have to wait for two weeks. Uh, and then you might see that after one hour, when it doesn't converge, I have to uh, cancel it. And I have to wait another two weeks, which is quite painful if you're a bachelor student and you have to finish after six weeks, nine weeks. Um, end of it. Uh, okay, so what we are trying to do now um, or what I'm trying to, to tell the students that are doing their thesis at our group, is uh, we need to go from the handcrafted features, which uh, we pretty much abundant <coughs> for the convolutional neural net stuff and the machine learning stuff, to handcrafted networks. Because it turns out the smaller your net, the easier to train. However, the smaller your net, um, the less impressive it is, and the more you have to care about what you're actually doing, because you don't have it huge parameter space where you can just smooth out some corners and edges here and there. Um, okay, and that's pretty much what I call coaching. So it's like an interactive training with the network. So I'm aware that 
in a company environment, it might not be feasible all the time because you can't pay a person sitting there for two weeks and tuning the hyperparameters of an app. However, there are options that do that automatically and you can look into the results once in a while and you can check if it's still good or if you should start retraining at some point or if you're already, already been there and you could take one net and deploy that. Um, however, when you have the big problems getting things running the first time, it might be worth having someone sitting there and spending a few days or even a few weeks um, checking what your data is actually worth. Um, it doesn't help if you have uh, terabytes of data which are wrongly labeled and you don't realize until week number six or eight, um, or until the end of your grant, if you are uh, really unlucky. Okay, so my coaching, I pretty much said all of that. So usually the big models we have, experts say they are too large for the problem. So uh, I don't know if you heard of it, there's a very, um, often cited paper for uh, biological image segmentation. Uh, it's called the UNET, so it's a convolutional neural net with some shortcut connections in between. And uh, it's from Olaf uh, Ronneberger. And he said himself that he strongly believes that the network is way too big for the problem they are trying to solve. However, they had the resources, they had the data, they could train on it, and they had really good results, so they reported it. And now, everyone who's doing biological image segmentation in 2 or 3D is just using that network and just changes a few tiny bits and pieces. However, you could assume that uh, for most of the tasks that networks apply to, it's too big. And if you look at stuff like ResNet 1020 or so, you could assume that there might be a bit too much parameters in there that, that's what you actually need to solve the problem. However, um, larger than that, the more smooth or the more learnable your loss function tends to get. So uh, the larger the net, usually, the better your convergence is, especially at the beginning. Um, however, then you have the problems with overfitting, so you might need more data, or you might put in some regularizer terms that just shrink the effective model size. It's not nothing else. So um, yeah, you just have those constraints put on the model so it can't reach its whole power just so you don't get the overfitting problems. Um, so what are we looking for at our group? We look for well-designed models, well-chosen hyperparameters, and of course, high-quality data. So it might be worth checking the quality of your data, getting some more really well-chosen examples, instead of just randomly labeling data sets in there. Um, and yeah, so that's, again, that's coaching. Do the interaction, check what your model needs, check where you have problems with your model, and then act uh, to improve it. Um, with very specific tasks. So now, um, I will start with the first uh, concrete topic, let's say. Um, so what do you do with, with the little data? So uh, at first I want to give some ideas how you could uh, create uh, new labels without uh, needing too much time. Then I want to give some ideas of how you could um, identify how much data you need exactly. Um, it's actually quite funny questions we get asked pretty often if we work together with companies and they say, yeah, we want to predict that and that. And one of the first questions they ask is how much data do you need? And usually we have to say we don't know. Um, of course, if, if it's a classical image segmentation task, you have an idea. Um, if you want to do something completely new, like predicting some timelines of some sensor data you've never seen before, you just can't tell. And usually companies don't believe you because they say, yeah, but you have experience in machine learning. Yes, we do, but it's completely different problems, it might be completely new networks, so we don't really know. So the first thing we have to do is get something running on as little data as possible, and then try to get an idea of how much data we actually need to reach our goals. And uh, in the end, I want to point out some alternatives of uh, what you could do besides getting more data or besides creating more labels. Um, okay, so data versus labels. Um, you might get lots of unlabeled data, maybe from the internet, maybe from other sources, maybe even your partners or your customers have heaps of data. However, they don't have any labels for it, or they, the labels do not have the quality you would actually like to have. Um, so, um, what could you do with that 
Um, one of the first things is, again, try to get something running with the labels, make a very easy regression or classification task out of it, and then have a look at how um, your label-wise scores do look. So um, if, you, if you see that for one specific label, your loss is much higher than for everything else, chances are you have some labeling problems with, with that, or you have too few examples for that specific label, stuff like this. Um, if you don't have any labels at all, of course, try to do some unsupervised learning methods, some unsupervised clustering methods. There's actually one we're talking on in Houston at the moment on uh, unsupervised clustering, so sorry you missed that, but maybe you can watch it later. Um, and what you can also do is uh, things called assisted labeling. I don't know if anyone worked with that or read about that. Please. Okay, so the idea behind that is um, you have some user interface that where you can actually like paint labels, usually if you have image data or video data. So you get an image displayed and you paint inside the labels, and then you can train a very small classifier and that gives you a prediction. And also it gives you a score on how confident the classifier is that uh, certain pixels belong to class A or B. And then according to that results and according um, to the confidence map you will get, you can start putting in more labels. So actually, it shows you where it's worth doing more manual labeling, where you are not very confident on how your data looks like. And I've put in here uh, two um, software packages that are available or will soon be available. One is Elastic from the University of Heidelberg, I think it's from 2012, and it can deal very nicely with image data and image text, so that includes video. <coughs> and another one is a uh, tool called Grinder from the University of of Münster, which is not released yet, but it will be released pretty soon, I was told. Um, so, Elastic trains uh, random forests on uh, image data with features you can manually choose, and then you paint in your labels and you get the responses from the net, and that helps you to create the data very easily and quickly. Uh, of course, if you want to do that in 3D, you still have the timing problems, but at least you have something to get it going. Um, another nice thing might be uh, autoencoders and other generative approaches like variational autoencoders and GANs because you don't need any label data for them. Um, so that's like a semi supervised or even unsupervised learning approach. However, um, problems there, especially the, the generative uh, adversarial networks, um, are pretty high topic in the last two years. However, now you have two networks that you have to train, you have to get to converge, so uh, you might have even more problems, especially in environments where it's hard to get uh, data at all. Um, and the last thing that's usually done, and uh, you should be very careful when applying them, is undersampling. So if you have uh, lots of labels from the background, but only little labels from the foreground, people tend to say, well, okay, I only take every tenth uh, set or yeah, from the background, uh, but every pixel from the foreground. Um, or the other thing is doing data augmentation, like mirroring or warping images. However, you have to be very careful that you always get out what you put in as a model. So if you put in that uh, mirroring a data set doesn't make any problem, then you will get a model out of it where mirroring is not a problem. However, if you understand all the things behind your data that well that you can judge all the data augmentation parts, it might be worth to do actually some model-based machine learning and not just throwing on them big machine learning models like your <coughs> nets. Um, so I usually advise not to do any data augmentations if you're not really, really sure that nothing can go wrong. For example, in the 3D uh, microscopy stacks, um, you can't do any uh, rotations because you regret the resolution differs in a uh, different direction, and you have uh, n isotropic images as well. So if you if you rotate the images, then you have huge problems because you're not going to learn anything, uh, at least on anything readable. Okay, so another interesting approach is the pseudo labeling approach, and I will go very quickly through that. Who has read about that? Nice. Okay. So the idea is you have a few labels of, uh, and here it's two glasses, so uh, class red and class green, and you have only a few labels for them, and you're pretty sure that they won't be enough to train your big machine learning system. However, 
what you can do is you can train an easy classifier like a regressor, and you might find out that um, it does a pretty good separation between uh, your class examples. It's not perfect, as you can see, so you have a few outliers in there that are perfect, um, but it's okay. -ish. So what you can do now is you can take your unlabeled data, it's uh, shown as these squares, which are the shaded, and you can label them as well with your regressor you've just trained. So you will assign labels um, depending on the area where you are in. And now what you can do is you have a few sets in there which are where you are pretty confident that uh, they belong to class red or green. And those are the ones, at least in how I plotted it, that are, uh, not, uh, that are far enough away from your separation line. So you are confident they are pretty sure belong to this class. And now you take those labels as well, or that label data as well, and put it again in your training data set. Um, you have to be careful, you don't, you shouldn't treat them as original labels, so you should use like lower weights on them for the loss or whatever, but you have a good chance that you will get a better, or that your machine learning algorithm will get a better impression of what really makes the data for a certain class. Um, and now, if you have the data, you can go on and you can do like a cascade of smaller classifiers to create more and more labels. Um, especially if you combine that with the manual labeling task, um, you have a very powerful approach that will give uh, pretty good results pretty soon, because at least you can spare yourself the labeling of, of those sets around here, and you only have to label those uh, small ones. Of course, what you have to keep in mind is don't expect any extrapolation uh, from that approach. So if you have, if you have in this example, a data point down here, don't expect the classifier to do anything sensible with it. So always be aware of where the clusters are and where the data is. Um, that must be checked uh, separately. Okay, so now, given we have uh, created some labels, what we usually do then is we start our first pretty small neural network and we get into training, and the first thing we usually look like is a uh, loss curve, so we have the loss plot on the y-axis and the iterations on the epochs on the x-axis, and somehow it looks like this. So um, here we have the training loss as a green line and the test loss as a red line, and what you can see in here, they behave pretty okay, so the test loss is not too bad compared with the, with the training loss, However, we think that actually you want to be somewhere down here. So something's going wrong and you're not converging. Um, so what might be the problem? Um, most probably, either you have to train a bit longer. However, if you have trained that for 500 epochs and it doesn't get any better, then you can stop most probably, because that won't help. Um, so the problem is that your model does not comprehend the information you have to do your training. Um, what Many people tend to do anyway. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not too boring. <laughs> uh, what what many what many people tend to do um, is to just say, okay, I need I need more training data because I'm not getting good enough. Um, the thing is, you don't need more training data because your training data is not be better than your test data. So your model just can't grasp all the information that is in there. So you need to change the training. You don't need to waste any time labeling data. You might do that later when you have a better idea of what's going on. So what you might do is increase the model size. Maybe your model is too small to, to get all the information out of it or to handle all the information. Or tune your hyperparameters, of course. Churning, changing learning rates, using different grade decent methods, do whatever you have in your toolbox um, to, to get that running quicker. Um, actually, the advice I give most often to the students is use an SVM or a random forest and see if it works with that. And once we get that going, then we can still uh, see if, if we apply neural nets to it as well. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, so second approach. Maybe you've tuned some hyperparameters and now your learning rate looks like this. So training loss is actually where we want it to be. However, now test loss um, is, there's a big separation between them two. So that's, Pretty much what you see in your in every school book about machine learning and training neural nets, um, you get all the information out of your training data. That's because your model is that good. You might even get too much training information out of it. Um, 
However, your training data does not contain enough information to actually map the test data as well. Um, so now this is the point where you should make up your mind about how to get new training data and um, yeah, how to create more labels or how to pre-train maybe with unlabeled data. Um, yeah, those are the approaches almost usually you take. Also make sure that your training data actually covers your whole input space. So it might be that you're somehow biased with your labeling, so let's say you want um, to label timelines and you always take timelines from um, the first five days of the month because uh, that's how your directory structure looks like and whoever labels clicks on that folder and then starts labeling the data and um, so maybe you never get uh, training data from the third or fourth week of the month and something changes in there so always make sure and um, always talk to the people or um, make a list for yourself um, that you actually cover your whole input space, no matter what you think might be relevant and what might not. Um, so again, you might have a, a model in mind where it doesn't matter from which day of the week your data comes from. However, it might uh, make a big difference and you don't see it. <clears throat> again, if you make sure that uh, your input space is covered, um, you could also try to decrease the model size uh, so you reduce the generalization error. That's a bit counterintuitive, actually, because if you if you say uh, that train uh, the test loss is too high, uh, usually you would not want to decrease the model size. However, it might work actually because um, you get better generalization, so you get better on uh, the unseen data. Okay, now that's the very classic. So you are in an overfitting regime everything looks fine and then at a certain point your test loss goes up. That's a very clear indicator uh, that you are overfitting your training data, which means either you will need more training data, so you stop your overfitting, or you do the generalization, uh, uh, or you do the, um, you do the um, constraints on, um, on your neural network, so putting some more loss on big weights or whatever. Um, or what you can do as well is, uh, if you're quite happy with that result down there, just stop the training there and everything's fine. So actually getting a model to overtrain is not always a big problem. If, uh, before you are in that overtraining regime, if you're fine with the loss, just stop training there and make sure that you're, for your deployed network, that you've actually stopped the training before going into the overfitting regime. So I would advise like stopping somewhere here so uh, you still have some margin uh, to the overfitting regime, and then it should work pretty well. All right, so what else, what else can you do? Of course, you could always add more data to it, never hurts, so never makes anything worse than it was before, uh, besides, oh, um, compared to making a net network bigger, that might actually make things worse than before. Um, however, it comes at high cost, so you don't want to do that. Uh, most often. Um, increasing data quality might be cheaper, so it might be worth just going through your data and check if all your labels are correct. Um, if you have some r random labels or random images in there or some other <coughs> data sets. Um, find the right model size. So, uh, as I said, the smaller the model, the, net, the less data you need to train it. So it's worth checking um, if the model is uh, small enough for your problem. Or as small as you can make it for your problem. And yeah, check the worst and best examples of data that's pretty much checking the data quality or the label quality. Okay, that's it for um, the labeling issues. So, um, any questions, comments, experiences, somewhere? Okay. Yes? Um, what about active learning? What about active learning? Um, well, of of course, you can do that as well. Uh, active learning is, um, if you remember what I said about the elastic tool and the uh, um, semi-supervised labeling, that's pretty much what you would deem as active learning as well. Um, of course, you can, you can do that as well. However, um, the biggest problem for that is, for doing active learning as well as doing the semi-supervised uh, labeling um, or the assisted labeling, uh, you will need some algorithm that's, that already works somehow. So um, once you got that, yeah, sure, you, you can try that as well. 
And yeah, again, there are many different methods. Yes. What's um, synthesized data? So creating the training set is completely artificial, but yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a bit the generative approach, isn't it? So um, if you can synthesize the data, again, I would say um, do a model-based machine learning approach. So if if you have as much information about your data that you can actually synthesize good examples, there might be better solutions than training in neural net. Um, that's that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, however, there, there are papers published that train their nets uh, only on synthesized data and then apply to real world data and it works pretty well. Um, so yeah, of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are many more uh, approaches you can take and it will work in some case and that won't in others. Um, but yeah, that's something I, I, I should say anyway. Um, please don't expect anything from networking uh, whenever you try to uh, get something going. So most probably most of the things I tell you won't, uh, won't work uh, at your particular example, but hopefully you will find one or two that uh, actually make uh, life a bit easier. Um, okay, so now what do we do with little resources? Um, that means you have like uh, only small memory or you only have a small power budget, so you want to boil down your network, you want to boil down your computation time. Um, or again, you could also treat data as a resource, so you don't have enough data, so you want a small network. What can you do about that? And basically, there are three main goals you could look at, so you could analyze the weights of the net, you could analyze you could analyze the input vectors you get into every layer, and you could analyze the output you get out of every layer, which is, of course, the output of one layer is also the input of, of another layer, um, but you're looking on that from different viewpoints. Um, actually, a very nice recent paper for that, oh no, I just wanted to tell that. Sorry. Um, the, that's actually the first well-known paper about visualizing what neural networks actually learn. So it's from 2014, uh, it's by Salem Fergus, and they started to visualize what a neural network filter actually learns and where the output comes from. And you get an idea of what a certain layer actually um, fires on. So down here you can maybe see uh, a face or you can say something that looks like uh, you can see something that looks like a tire, for example. So that's straight on the ImageNet data set. So you have some pretty clear structures in there. And um, of course, in the first layer, you learn some blobs and edges and stuff. And so you get more and more co complex um, objects you learn. And that was actually a pretty cool paper in, in those days because you could see what deep learning actually means. It was pretty much the first paper that worked on many different neural nets and showed you that you were, that you were actually aggregating features to more and more complex uh, ideas. Um, however, you have some problems with that because um, it's infeasible for on-the-fly analysis just because you have to put so much um, compute resources into rendering those images of the small filters that you just can't uh, check how well the training is going. So everything you can tell is once your network's working, uh, what have I learned actually? And there's a nice anecdote about some um, algorithm, I don't really know which one, but they're trying to uh, classify horse breeds. And they had extremely good results um, discerning one breed from another. And after looking at those features, it turned out that every training image they had for the one horse breed was with the same watermark in the right bottom corner. So what the network learned was just recognizing that watermark and whenever that appears, they said, yeah, okay, that's 3 a um, So that might be something you would have seen with that if you looked at your network often. Um, however, if you look at something like this, so that's a more uh, up-to-date version of visualizing what the layer learns, and there are actually many papers, and I've put down a few of them, um, it's quite hard to interpret what's, what's going on in there. So if, if you would change a few filters in there, no one could tell you if that would make your net better or worse. So all you can do is basically check, do I have different filter results, or do I get the same thing recognized in 10% of all my filters? If that happens, then you should do something for your training. Um, as long as they look different and you see something like structures, and you have image data, which is um, 
quite a constraint. Um, then, yeah, that's that's all you can get out of it. And of course, you can make nice images. So uh, maybe um, it's good for a proof of concept, or if you want to um, convince the customer that you are actually doing cool work, images like this are usually helpful. Um, yeah, however, not not really helpful if you want to see how well your training works. Um, instead of rendering all those images, pretty much the same information you get out of just looking at the statistics of your weights. So um, basically what you, what you want to have is a nice mean close to zero, you want a nice standard deviation, so actually you want a distribution that looks like a Gaussian, at least a little bit. Um, what you don't want is some outliers that are like three orders of magnitude higher than all the rest. Um, <clears throat> You want that for all single convolutional filters or for all uh, neurons in your fully connected layer or however you name it. Um, you can also check uh, how well that works for recurrent nets, um, especially for LSTMs if you look at the um, if you look at the layers inside the LSTM. Um, so that, that applies to everything and that usually gives you a bit more information and a bit easier to compute information than what you get uh, out of those random images which is still look pretty cool. Um, what you can also do is look at pairwise distances of filters. Um, that's also something that you can compute pretty easy. You can extract pretty easy from pretty much every uh, training framework. And um, what you will see is if you have filters that are pretty close to each other, because that's a pretty good indication that you might be able to do with only one of them. Um, so you might be able to, to just uh, decrease the number of neurons in that certain way. Um, however, there comes some problems with trainability. Um, yeah, but it's uh, worth doing and checking. Um, okay, yeah, so what you want, smooth distributions of weights without too many outliers. Um, the weights for the neurons should be in a similar distribution for one layer. So you don't want or you, you want your, your probability distribution for your weights in one layer to be approximately in the same distribution. Uh, again, if there are one neuron is firing like ten times heavier than another one, um, you pretty much will get some problems with the output of that layer. Um, okay. So and now another nice thing uh, that was recently suggested uh, beginning of this year by uh, Petrotti et al. Um, and they propose a more visual approaches to actually look at what's going on. It's a bit more computation expensive. However, it's easier to render than those uh, filter images and you get a pretty good idea of what's going on in the learning task. So first what they're doing is at one layer they look at a neuron and look at the receptive field of that neuron in the previous layer. So here that's like 25 activations in one channel and then maybe you have, I don't know, 64 four channels or whatever. And then they take those activations, concatenate them in one long feature vector and do a t-distributed, t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. I don't know if you've seen uh, of that. Um, and basically they, they try to find a projection into 2D space which keeps clusters alive in the high dimension space. And um, then they plot one point for every input they have, and they color the point according to the label that the input has. And it looks like that. So what you can see in here is a 10 class problem, and you have many different colors. And what you can see is uh, first that the, you haven't solved the problem yet. However, what you can also see is that you get some kind of structure in the data. So you have the bluish colors here, which appears to be a one. Um, but the bluish stuff here, that, that's pretty much on the one side. And you can also see that maybe here's a bit more green than everywhere else. And you might get a little red cluster if you train on a little more. And actually, if you can that, or if you run that parallel to your training and you look at it every hour or so, you will actually get a pretty good idea of what's, of what's going on if you're converging or um, if you should restart the training or rethink what you're doing. Um, and another thing, what you could also do, um, 
to take them off in the US as well. Okay. Um, another thing what you could also do is a bit more detailed view in one hand side than what you have just seen before. So in here, we look at the output of one uh, neuron, and I will stop that here. So that's pretty much two examples. In here, we see uh, 100 neurons belonging to the same layer in a trained neural network. And uh, what we see in here is a probability distribution for 10 classes we have in the network. And it's an intermediate layer, so we don't expect any neuron to separate one class from all the others. But what we want to have is some nice spread probability distribution. So um, that's pretty much what the color gives you. Um, so if you, if you look at that distribution, it's all clustered in one area. Um, whereas if you look at this one, it's nicely spread and could even separate like two different kinds. So you have like that in, on the left hand side and those other three colors on the right hand side. So it seems like that neuron does something pretty useful nicely separate um, two, two classes. And over here. Let's see. Oh, it's not actually. OK. Um, if you're interested, uh, I can show it off. Actually, what you would have seen in that video is that you get um, over time, so that elapses over a few uh, epochs of training, and what you can see is that you get some uh, neurons that are colored more and more red. And um, what you will be able to see in the end is that you have uh, some really dark red neurons where all the probability distributions have collapsed into one um, output range. And that's zero, it's just because we have user and uh, the Prelu activated neural net. So um, everything that uh, is below zero gets just clipped to zero as an output. And if you have a zero output and you do your gradient descent back propagation, you get a zero gradient. So whenever you are on the zero or on the negative side of an activation of the neuron, you stop learning. And if that happens for all your data samples, then you're just locked in there and you can't get out of it. And that's actually a good hint um, that you might have to do something about your training. Maybe you change your activation function, maybe tune some learning rate hyperparameters so you go over um, below the minima, or you could try to reinitialize uh, some weights according to this. So there's many things you could do about it. However, you should be aware that you might have to do something about it, especially if it gets like 10% or 20% of your neurons. Um, or you could, again, just cut down the number of neurons in, in that layer and see if it works. OK. So um, what you can also do is uh, another output-based uh, analysis. And that's uh, not just looking at the output of one single neuron, but looking at um, the output of uh, the collections of neurons and see how m much they interact. And uh, that's another TC plot. So that's two different layers. And that's the last layer of the net, actually. And you can see that you have, again, a 10 class problem. And you have 10 nicely colored blocks, which are well separated. So you're pretty good with that. And you can say that your net trains pretty well. Of course, you will see that in the loss function as well. Um, however, um, here you could also easily identify that maybe those two classes are not too easy to separate. Maybe you want to do something about it. Maybe you don't care, but you're happy that maybe you want. Um, whereas here you have some intermediate layer. What you can see in here is that there are pretty m m many blue and greenish colored dots, and you have some colors missing in there. Um, so if your training goes on like that, and um, you might want to have a net that is as small as possible, you um, should probably do something with your training data to put some more emphasis on those colors that are missing, on the classes that, you, uh, that belong to the colors that are missing. OK, and another output-based thing, what you could also do is uh, label your inputs according, or color your inputs according to the label, and then um, show what neuron activates how much on those uh, examples. So the black colors show you the um, amount of activation from a certain selected neuron, 
and which data sample that belongs to. And what you can see in here is you have selected one neuron that fires on pretty much everything, including revenue, um, which is a, uh, a neuron from an early layer, so that's so okay. -ish. Um, what you can see in here is a neuron that fires pretty distinct on only that uh, side of the class over here. And all that is from the paper of uh, Pensati et al. So uh, it's pretty handy tool. <coughs> they have not released it yet, but um, we are working together with them to build it into our open source software, then everyone can use it um, if you want. And if you have two GPUs available because you need one for training, you can readily Okay, um, final warning. I've said many times that you could maybe reduce the size of the neural net. Um, be aware that when you reduce it too much, you might have problems getting it to converge because your loss surface gets more and more complex and gradient descent might not find good local minima. Um, so that can be a big problem. So it turns out that for some problems you need to start with big nets and then maybe you can start pruning single neurons or pruning single layers out of the net afterwards. Okay, so I'm pretty much up with my time. So I'm um, go quickly over the last slides, which is a debugging neural networks. So what can you do if your net doesn't converge like you want it to be? So that again is the example with the high loss even on the training data. Um, check the loss for a single class. I've already said that uh, print print the confusion matrix and look how uh, how the probabilities are distributed. So here we have the true label on the y-axis, the predicted label on the on the um, x-axis. And for example, you can see down here that class number nine is actually very often uh, predicted as being class number four. So you, you want to do something about that if, if it stays like this in, in the training. You get a nice diagonal, but somewhere you get a really dark uh, square in there odds are you have some labeling problems, so you have some data labeled wrong, and that just trains your net on the wrong properties. Um, and another very nice uh, implementation which you can use online um, is from Bach et al, and they actually try to explain where the classification comes from. So you put in a handwritten number, and um, you get an explanation why the network thinks um, that's actually a 3 in here. So it sees that there is no connection there, no connection there, so it's not an 8, but a 3. Um, and uh, if, you, if you would look uh, for the maybe arguments, the, uh, the neural network sign for an 8, you will see that there's the connection there, and the spot up there, and the connection down here. So you could pretty much interpret what's going on. And that's still easier than um, then doing the rendering of the learned filters, which I've shown before. Okay, what else can you do? A bit more um, advanced initialization of your filters. Don't just use noise. Uh, maybe you want to use uh, k-means clustering in advance and then initialize your filters with, with the set rates of k-means clusters. Um, that was actually proposed in 2012 and uh, comes in pretty handy sometimes. And k-means is pretty fast as well, so you get your first step of uh, initializing a neural net quite easily and you start with very good convolutional filters in the first uh, place. Um, yeah, look at the weights, values, and gradients, do the histogram plotting, look that your gradients are reasonable sized, so you want the gradients to be smaller than your weights, usually. Um, if you have a gradient that is like 10 times as large as uh, your weight, then it's applied on. Usually something's wrong, either with your handwritten neural network training tool, or <coughs> with your loss function, or something like that. Uh, at least you should look into that if that happens regularly. Um, okay, and again, analyze your data. Look into details, what the labels for your data are, where it comes from, um, if you have put the right labels on there, and yeah, check single class losses. Yeah, that's all I can say about that. And I will leave a conclusion at right there. I've said all of this. So, questions? Yes? Um, <laughs> oh, I think the mic is coming. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you very much. So maybe I missed a very crucial part, actually. So um, when you talked about um, what do you do if you don't have enough computing resources, yes. you mentioned all these tools, weight-based, input-output-based. But why, what I don't really get is how does it actually save me resources if I need the neural net to have the ways that I can then look at? Um, I would say um, if, you, if you don't have any resources to train in neural net, well, you, you have a problem. Um, what I was trying to say with that is um, keep your model size as small as possible in the beginning and then gradually start to increase. So don't, don't start with a ResNet 500 and throw it on your data so you only have like a batch size of one and you can only uh, put in one sample every second because it will cost you weeks of training and then you realize that it doesn't converge. Um, so keep your model small. Keep, uh, start training with uh, small machine learning algorithms like random forest and SEM, which are easy to train or even regression. And uh, once you've got that going and you get an impression of how complex your data is and how complex your network should be, then you can go off 